Hello fellow true crimers, it is Crime with Ashley here and I am finally back with a case. I know it has been such a long time, but somehow I've managed to get a few new subscribers. The last time I filmed a video, I think I had about 76 and now I have 80, so that's four more of you. I try to keep track because, you know, every week that I don't produce a video, I would just felt like I was failing and it was just... It was just not a good time, but I don't plan on leaving again, so we're going to go ahead and get into a case. Um, I want to do this thing where I'm going to try to do a case every single day because I have about three lined up that I want to do at least five, so I need to get two more cases cracking. Um, and also, I would have you know that I actually changed my researching a lot. I... Don't just go a couple hours deep anymore. I actually take quite a bit of time on these cases to get them right. So I don't know if the length is going to improve because I feel like my videos are a pretty decent length. You know, I don't want them to be super, super long because then I'll just be rambling. But I do, I do think that they're a pretty good length. So we're going to go ahead and get into um, an unsolved case. I'm not really sure the theme of this week because I do plan, like I said, on doing a video every week. I'm not sure what the theme of this week is going to be. I just know that this first case that I wanted to share with you is unsolved. And it, when I came across it, I actually came across it in this book that I wanted to recommend to anybody that still, you know, reads books. I don't know. A lot of people that I, I know don't actually have time to read books because, um, we're doing a lot of things with our kids, with our jobs, with cleaning, with with all kinds of things. And there's just not enough time in the day to read a book. But I actually found this really good book because I had some extra time throughout my days, you know, recently. And it is called Unsolved Murders, True Crime Cases Uncovered. This is what it looks like. It is pretty cool, and I'm actually going to be covering a case that's inside the book. I'm going to do my best not to plagiarize everything because I actually did do some research as well. This is just um, my stepping stone, and it actually has so many great details. The authors of this book are amazing, and, you know, they answered a lot of the questions that were going on through my head as... You know, I was reading it, but again, it is unsolved, just as I'm saying in the beginning. So don't expect a neat little ending with a bow. I know sometimes that can be a little bit irritating, but um, I wanted to do an unsolved case for you guys. So I'm going to go ahead and stop talking now and get into it and let me know what you guys think down below. And I actually have something else to say to you if you make it all the way to the end of my video, and I will love you forever if you do. So can't wait to talk to you at the end. Okay, so what caught my attention on this particular case, which is called the Oakland County Killer Case, Child Killer Case, uh, it actually goes by a few different names, but that's the one that I've actually seen the most, but it is called Stranger Danger in the book, and I don't know about you guys, but when I was growing up, I was born in 97, so, you know, early 2000s, I was growing up. I was told, you know, stranger danger, don't talk to strangers, don't take candy, don't care about a puppy. Yeah, I was told if they have a puppy, who cares? Um, my grandparents, who my grandparents are the ones who raised me, they always told me that if they couldn't pick me up, they would let me know beforehand. They had no friends that were just, they, my grandparents were very, very thorough. Maybe that is because they were in a time where kids were just getting snatched. So they were very, very careful, but it really caught my attention because there's just some details about it that make you just kind of tilt your head and kind of think about it and go, huh, well, I guess that, I guess, you know, you just, I guess. So we're going to go ahead and get in. We're going to go ahead and get into the first victim, and his name is Mark Stebbins, and he disappeared in February of 1976, and he was only 12 years old at the time, and I'm going to go ahead and get into the day that he went missing, because all that I could really find on him, besides what was said in the book, was that he was just a really great student, and he was kind of shy, didn't have very many friends, and the only person that he really did hang out with was his older brother, Mike. So, this particular day... Mark and Mike Stebbins, and again, um, Mark is the victim, Mike is the older brother, 
Mark and Mike were at the American Legion pool hall where they actually spent a lot of time playing pool. It was something they liked to do together that they were pretty good at. And it was a very nice day and it was something that they had been looking forward to all day. And during about a few hours in, apparently, Mark had said that he was over it and he just wanted to go and watch television. So... Mike, who'd been looking forward to it, and he thought his brother had been too, I assume, but Mike decided to go ahead and stay because he was having a good time and, you know, stay. So Mark went off on his own, and he was going to take a path that he and his brother had taken or do take all the time that he'd taken with friends, and he'd taken, well, he'd just taken it all the time, apparently. So he takes this path, and, well, he presumably takes this path, but when Mike gets home later on, his mother asks where his brother is. And he says, well, he should have been home hours ago. He left way before I did. And she says, well, no, he never showed up. And nobody really knew what happened. They didn't even really presume it was foul play until a couple of weeks later, his body was found in an abandoned parking lot. And not only had it been found in an abandoned parking lot with nothing around, sorry, it's just... This is the part where it gets me. His whole entire body had been scrubbed clean. He had been dressed very neatly. And there was signs of sexual assault on Mark. There were signs of a sexual assault. They could tell, you know, later on when they did the autopsy and everything, when they checked, because there's ways to check even if your body has been scrubbed clean. Um, but he was scrubbed clean. And even his fingernails had been scraped underneath. So there was no way of getting any sort of DNA evidence, um, bio evidence. There's a, there's a better word for it, but bio evidence, you know, fibers and, and semen and, and different things that come out of the human body, bodily fluids, whatever. But the body had just been scrubbed completely clean. So there were, there was no suspects. There was no evidence. There was just clearly a sign of foul play because there was his cause of death, and then he was just found there completely scrubbed clean. His cause of death being strangulation or suffocation, and also besides the fact that he was scrubbed clean and the sexual things that they found later on, he also had rope burns on his wrist. Sorry, I had to go back and make sure that I hadn't missed every little thing, and I didn't except for the rope burns, but clearly it was foul play but he had been strangled or suffocated. I it just kept saying or suffocated, but I assume if it says strangled there, when you're strangled, there's usually, there's usually evidence of strangulation. There's bruising on the neck. There's a bone in your neck that I wish I knew the name of that. I should know the name of that would be great to insert in here. I will, I will put it right here, <laughs> but that is the name of the bone that is right here. And usually about 50% of the time, if you're strangled, it is broken and or fractured, but there's usually, there's evidence, you know? So I believe if they said strangulation, then there was probably something leading to strangulation. Suffocation is a lot harder to tell. Because you're covering, you can cover somebody's nose and mouth and you don't necessarily leave any trace of that, any marks, you know, unless they struggle pretty bad and you break something. But usually there's not a lot of evidence of suffocation. But either way, police knew that Mark had been a victim of foul play and he was going to be one of four victims that are going to be a result of this killer. At least this is the connections. I'm going to go ahead and go into those. Okay, so we talked about how Mark was pretty shy and he was a loner and everything like that. So just keep that in mind when I'm about to bring up this next victim, the second victim, that was discovered on December 26th, 1976. And also Mark was discovered February 19th, 1976. So this is a few, a good few months later. Um... So a good time period between Mark and, and Jill. So Jill Robinson was only 12 years old. And like I said, she was discovered on December 26th, 1976, just the day after Christmas. 
And at first, when she was discovered, police weren't exactly sure if there was a connection between Mark Stebbins because her manner of death was completely different. Instead of asphyxiation, she was shot to the head. She had a shotgun wound to the head. So she was shot in the head. But there were some simula similarities. It's been a while, you know, I can't talk ever. But there were some similarities between them that had police going, hmm, maybe these could be related. And it was actually kind of had to do with them when they were alive. Not kind of. It did. <laughs> so the police noticed and they looked into both children's backgrounds. Mark's parents were divorced. By the way, I, I think I forgot to mention earlier that he was being raised by his mom, you know, but Mark's parents were divorced and Jill's parents were divorced. And the reason actually that Jill had even left that night was because she got into an argument with her mom over dinner and decided to take a walk and she was never seen again. But the similarities besides their parents being divorced was also they were pretty close to their mothers and they were loners and shy and they didn't really have a lot of friends. So those were some similarities that the police found. And also they found that Mark with the rope burns on his wrist and the fact that his body cleaned besides the assault stuff they found, it was pretty well taken care of. And it had been a few weeks until they found his body and there wasn't really any decomposition. So he had, he had to have been held and then killed. He had to, you know, held for a minute and then been killed, which was hence the rope burns. So Jill had rope burns on her wrist as well, and her body had also been cleaned, scrubbed clean, dressed neatly, and placed basically for somebody to just buy. And those were the similarities between the two victims. But the difference in the third victim is there was such a big gap between Mark and Jill that on January 2nd, 1977, so just one week after the disappearance, well, after Jill had been murdered and found and everything like that, just one week after that, little 10-year-old Christine, I'm so sorry, I'm going to butcher her name. It's such, it looks like such a pretty name, and it sounds uh, Mihalik, Mihalik, that's what I think it is, Christine Mihalik. But she was 10 years old, and here's the thing. Not only was it just a week later, but she was taken in broad daylight at around 3 p.m. after she went to the store to buy a magazine. So now he is quickening his, his snatching of them, and he's doing it in broad daylight and seemingly getting away with this because on January 19th, 1977, just... A few days after, you know, a week or so after her disappearance, her body was discovered in a ditch. And even though there was snow and, a, and just her hand was peeking out, the investigators could tell that she'd been dressed neatly and been cleaned of any DNA and bioevidence. And here's the thing as well, guys. Here's the thing as well, okay? Christine and Jill had no evidence of sexual assault. Okay, so even though there were similarities between all these children, there were certain things, the only so far victim that has been sexually assaulted in this case has been the boy. Two little girls, have they have found no evidence of sexual assault, none. So we're gonna go on to the fourth and final victim. Okay, so we're going to go ahead and go on to the fourth and final victim, and that is 11-year-old Tem King, and he was taken and killed in Birmingham, Michigan, which isn't super far from, obviously, the children. Like, there's a whole map. <clears throat> but he was taken, and um, he was taken in Birmingham, Michigan, and how it happened was at around 8.15 p.m., he had asked his sister Kathy for 30 cents to go to the local drugstore that was just down the street to get some candy. And she agreed and she gave it to him. So he hopped on his skateboard and he skateboarded to the local drugstore. And the clerk, Amy, said that she saw him leave at about 8.30 with his candy. And that's the last time that he was seen alive. But the kicker here is... Um, he was found just a couple of weeks later and he was found meticulously cleaned 
and everything just like the other victims and he was a, he was asphyxiated he had died of asphyxiation just like christine had and so far the only victim that had been shot in the head was jill so i don't think i've said that so out of the four victims three of them were suffocated or as asphyxiation they died of asphyxiation and jill had died of a shotgun blast to the head so Tim here is again. So while he was missing, clearly there's something going on here and everybody has been panicked. They were panicked when Christine was taken and just, just a short time later, Tim was taken. So everybody was in full panic mode. His parents were doing everything they could to reach their boy, but they did a press conference and his mother begged, you know, at the time, just in case he was a runaway, I guess, because that's the way it was worded to me, but his mother begged him to come home for his favorite meal of Kentucky Fried Chicken, right? Right? As I've said, all the victims, the, con the biggest connection is they've been held before they're killed, and as soon as they're killed, their bodies are basically discovered. So their bodies are in very good condition, very good condition, and they clearly have been kept alive, right? Here when they opened up Tim's stomach, they found fried chicken. The reason that, that just gets me is because to me, personally, I believe that the sicko that did this was watching these interviews, getting off on this, and, you know, maybe let the kids watch them too. I don't know. Maybe he had some kind of sick thing where he was trying to like get them to like him. But he was getting off on the fact that their parents were looking for them. And he decided to go ahead and feed Tim fried chicken. It just makes you sick. It really does. But again, his body was found meticulously cleaned. And he was found to have signs of sexual assault. So out of the four victims... The two males, Tim and Mark, are the ones who find sexually assaulted, but the two girls, Christine and Jill, had no signs of it. Alrighty, so we have already talked about the connections with all four of them being kept alive and pretty much being found as soon as they were murdered. Tim pretty much being found within an hour or so of it, according to investigators. But we're going to go ahead and talk about some of the suspects and some of the theories that have already been mentioned in this case, and then I'm going to go ahead and give my personal one. So I am going to refer to the book a little bit more on this part for a couple of reasons. One being, I don't care about the murderers in this. Maybe that's bad as a true crime investigator. I'm not saying like, I don't care. I mean, I care, but I'm on this case, I've mainly focused so much on the victims that my brain isn't really holding space for the little details of the serial killers that I do want you to know because they are important and I care, but you know what I mean? Just, I'm going to refer to the book. But before I do that, I'm not going to refer to the book on this dude because he was the main suspect and I want to wait till the end. I'm not going to get into it, but just know I'm leaning towards this one. Okay. You know what? Because of that, I'm going to wait until the end to give you that one. Yep, that's what I'm going to do. Yep, yep, yep. We're not going to talk about that one until the end. But he is the main suspect, and the families agree with me. So, okay. So, one of the suspects that was actually tested for this, I wanted to quickly throw in there because, I mean, it's... You know, it's, it could be a possibility. I'm not going to get too much into him, but John Wayne Gacy. Mm -hmm. I know that name sounds familiar. He's a very, very prolific serial killer. But John Wayne Gacy was tested with the, with the stuff that they did manage to find at the crime scenes. You know, because even though the bodies were meticulously cleaned, not everybody is perfect. And investigators can, you know... Science is amazing. So he was tested. John Wayne Gacy was cleared. And then another theory of this as well, because the two boys were sexually assaulted, but the two girls were not, is some kind of satanic ritual 
sacrifice thing that somebody was doing because after Tim, there were no other victims. There was no other killings, nothing like that. So yeah, the iPhone, again, I feel like there's a reason for that and we're going to get into that, but Yes, satanic rituals has also, whoa, girl, satanic rituals has, my hair is crazy, I do apologize for that, by the way, I don't think I've said sorry for my hair, but I do apologize, <laughs> but satanic rituals is a part of it, but another guy with the last name Gunnell, I believe it is, his name is Jacob Gunnell, he was only 16 at the time of this murder, but apparently there was a hair that was found on Christine's body that the mitochondrial DNA matched his hair, somehow matched it. So there was evidence found on one of the bodies, but that's the evidence connecting Gunnell to any of these murders. But he claims that he has no idea how that could have happened. He has no clue and that's crazy. So Jacob Gunnell is at least, you know, apparently linking in some DNA evidence. But okay, we're going to go ahead and get into the big theory of what I think happened and what a lot of people think happened. And it, it all evolves around this. Stuff. Okay, Christopher Bush. Yep, like Bush light the beer. Christopher Bush was a young he was described as good looking. I don't know. I'm not going to say that he was or wasn't because I can't find any pictures of him. But he was a son of a young, he was a young son of a executive car salesman. And he, they had a very good life. He was very rich, yada, yada, yada. Whoop -de -whoop. But here is the kicker, okay? After the time of Tim's murders, the last murders, Christopher Bush was questioned because he, is, he had a car similar to the one that was actually seen around the time of the investigations of a couple of the children. And I believe it was seen around Tim's and possibly seen around Jill's as well. But she was, you know, a little bit different. So, but it, it, had, said, it had been said to seen around Tim's and they were investigating Tim. So, they were talking about his car and he admitted to investigators that he was a pedophile and he admitted to seeing Tim, right? Right. And as soon as investigators started pushing him a little bit, just a couple of months after this weird encounter with talking to the investigators, he kills himself and they find a drawing of a boy that looks strikingly similar to Mark Stebbins screaming while he's being murdered. So he killed himself after the investigators were asking him about Tim and he admitted to being a pedophile. He admitted to knowing who Tim, or at least seeing Tim, they showed him a picture of Tim and he was like, yeah, I know who Tim is. Um, but he didn't admit to anything else other than that. And police obviously wanted to keep him there, but they didn't, they couldn't. So he was let go. And then just a couple of months later, he commits suicide. And there's a drawing of a boy that does not look like Tim, but looks like Mark Stebbins instead. And again, the only two victims of sexual assault were Mark and Tim. And the only victim that had not been suffocated was Jill. But all four victims had been kept alive and their bodies had been kept in pretty decent condition. They had been fed, they had been watered, they had been cleaned, they had been clothed, and you know, until they were murdered. So people are wondering how, if Christopher Bush did this with him being the son of a wealthy auto executive and, and having all of these things, like this good life, he was known. He was a well-known person. Okay? He was known. The people seen him how he managed to hold these children for at least a minimum of a week each without anybody knowing. People are wondering if maybe he had help, possibly Gunnel. Because hmm? Gunnel lived in the area at the time, just like Bush did. And people are saying, you know, it might, it might not have been a one person job. And, taking these children and keeping them locked up and, and 
doing everything that needed to be done to not get caught. So I personally think that that is a very, very, very high chance because that just makes the most sense to me that if Gunnell has DNA evidence that matches him to one of the one of the cases, he might be involved, right? But what if the main mastermind of this whole thing was Christopher Bush? Because come on, come on, come on. That drawing that looks like Mark Stebbins, like apparently like it looked like Mark Stebbins. Like investigators are like, no, like this, wow, you know, it's evidence. Does it make you think that Bush, you know, did this? I don't know. I don't know what else does because that's that really takes over the top for me. But Clearly, the reason that this is unsolved is because I believe the killer committed suicide. But people are saying that it's unsolved because there's just not enough evidence to go around to anybody. And investigators are pretty much with their hands tied. This is a cold case and it's unsolved and it's going to remain unsolved. And I do feel for the Mihalik and the King and, and the Stebbins and the Robinson families you know, because they, they don't know what happened to their babies, really. They don't know, they don't know who did this, who, who tortured them. Well, not tortured them, but I don't know. They're, we don't really know exactly what happened while they were in captivity, but, you know, their kids were clearly kept alive and then just murdered outright. And for two of the families, their children were definitely sexually abused. So it's a lot, but I am sorry that um, I have been a little bit all, all over the place with this. I'm a little bit rusty. It's been weeks since I've been in front of the camera. And even before that, we all know I just started this channel a few months ago. So it's not like I'm the most knowledgeable YouTuber out there. But I cannot believe that I actually have 80 subscribers. And I can't believe that You've stuck around all the way to this point if you're watching this, and it means so much to me, and I really hope that you enjoyed this case, at least enjoying the information about it, and I hope that you maybe check out this book. Like, this is a this is a pretty cool book. Um, I believe it should be in every public library, or you could find it online, maybe even in Audible, maybe you could listen to it. It'd be really cool. But one of the things that I wanted to say is there are 80 of you, and I know that I'm getting a few views per video, which is great, but I was wondering if you support my channel and you love my content and you want to keep seeing my content, I would really appreciate liking my videos and also sharing my videos, sharing them to your Facebook, sharing them to your Twitters, maybe mentioning something on Snapchat if you're really active on Snapchat. I don't know. Maybe you have a true crime Snapchat group. I don't know what you do. But <laughs> anywhere that you know of true crime or you know of people that might be into true crime, try to go ahead and get my videos out there. I appreciate constructive criticism. I want my YouTube family to help me grow and to learn with me and to just be on my channel with me and it would mean the world to me if we could meet a hundred subscribers. Like, oh wow, we're just 20 away and it would completely blow my mind and I would do something totally, completely awesome for it. Like, that's a goal, you guys. If you want me to do something totally awesome for the channel, like a really cool video or a new banner or something, something really cool. Let's get to 100 subscribers. Let's get 20 more people in our fam. Let's get 20 more people in the true crime thing that we got going on here. So thank you again for making it to this point. This is Crime with Ashley, and I love you guys so, so much. Thank you so much for watching my channel. Remember to like my videos and hopefully subscribe. So thank you so much for watching, and bye-bye.